Hi everyone, thanks for joining us on in the cybersecurity series. Uh, this one, this uh, webinar is about facing your adversary. Uh, our facilitator and speaker today is Prasad Kalyam. He's a professor at Mizzou and also director of Center for Cyber Education, Research and Infrastructure. Prasad, would you uh, introduce yourself a little more and then anyone else that's on your team on the call today? Thank you, Brittany. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon for those in uh, a different time zone. Uh, it's good to see you all back here. Um, and we're excited today to have the third webinar, uh, getting ready to face the adversary in the series of webinars on defending small business cyber assets. So I'll be your instructor. Uh, I'm a professor like Brittany. Uh, uh, introduced at the uh, University of Missouri in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department. I also direct the SERI Center and I have with me uh, you know, excellent uh, you know, co-instructors or guests here, uh, Jason Rinker from Stronghold Data, um, Angie Robinson from the Missouri Office of Homeland Security. Hopefully she'll join us later today. Um, and then my teaching assistants, Dr. Sanji Wang and Roshan, have also helped uh, put together this content for all of you. So welcome, and I'm excited to hear from all of you and uh, have a good discussion on this very important topic. So this is the team, uh, as I introduced, that's going to uh, take you and uh, Jason, uh, please feel free to you know, uh, uh, chip in at whatever point you can uh, in the discussions uh, and uh, We'll have a very interactive session. And today's um, webinar is, uh, you know, this third webinar in the series. Uh, we've actually finished two. Uh, the first one is about uh, understanding, you know, what are the modern attacks that happen, uh, understanding uh, where your assets are, how they are connected, and what could be some of the gaps in security. So that was the first webinar, is just knowing your security position uh, and recognizing the gaps. In the second webinar, we start thinking about creating a set of requirements uh, for security and coming up with these uh, requirements that can actually be implemented. And so we talked about some best practices and uh, essentially talk towards some dilemmas when you go into implementation in terms of cost and really knowing the adversary uh, is a very sophisticated adversary, what could you be doing? And also making sure that security doesn't come in the way of uh, your organization's productivity or usability. So if people are wanting to do you know, their workflows, you don't want security to be a burden that they complain or try to even worse get around it, which puts you in a difficult situation. Um, and we showed a live demonstration of how to think about some security principles uh, or best practices in a, a real application. Uh, so we're going to build on that today. Um, and uh, the coming two webinars will go uh, more advanced in terms of some defense techniques and also creating an ongoing risk profile that you can monitor and update um, to deal with all the daily changes of technology, different kinds of cyber attacks. So today it's mostly about detection, uh, intrusion detection and knowing your adversary and getting ready to face the adversary, right? Uh, once there is an attack, what do you do or how do you react? So we'll talk more about that. So our lesson plan today uh, will be a combination of uh, some you know, engagement at the beginning that will let me understand uh, your current understanding of this topic. And then I will provide certain content based on several years of experience uh, in research and development in government, academia, and industry. Uh, Jason will pitch in as needed uh, to fill in wherever I feel like there's a gap from a small business perspective. Uh, he's definitely been uh, a very valuable resource in this webinar series for us. Um, and then we'll do some interactive exercises um, and close strong. So that's our plan today. Uh, really, really happy that you're all here uh, through this. So, so let's get started on what we want to do, right? So today, as I said, we want to focus on getting ready to face the adversary. So 
let's understand what are these intruders up to? Uh, how do we know what their motivations are? How do they plan intrusions and know how we can detect those with relevant tools and technologies? And once we know the intruder better, uh, we could definitely try to be better than the intruder, right? So uh, if you know more than what the intruder knows, you can then definitely be uh, on top of the game. Uh, so, and that starts with monitoring and knowing uh, what intrusions are happening or what are possible, and then having a way that's data-driven to know how to deal with that incident, right? If whatever happens, you know, an intruder incident happens. And so we'll show you also a live demonstration of what a, a real intrusion looks like, right? Um, from an application perspective. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, what can we do uh, in the interactive exercise if there is actually a, an intrusion, how do we go about it? And uh, it's kind of an interesting exercise. I hope you'll enjoy it at the end of the uh, session. So uh, Brittany, can you please launch the poll? So I'd like you to basically answer uh, these questions. These are simple yes, no questions that tells me uh, your understanding of what we're going to talk today. So we're asking you, do you know a... what a zero day attack is? Yes, it's up, I can see that. Mm -hmm. So please go ahead and vote. And I'm asking you if you have uh, some familiarity with intrusion detection prevention systems. And do you have some kind of a monitoring to detect attacks? And uh, also, do you have some knowledge of some tools that you could use to defend? And we, this is more like a teaser for next webinar, but it's good to start that discussion today. So the last question is more on that. So thank you for answering the poll. We're getting close to everybody giving a response. Mm -hmm. So the good news is many of you know what a zero day attack is, that's great. And many of you know what an IDS IPS is. Um, and yeah, it, you're not all ready in terms of a monitoring system to rapidly detect attacks. And that uh, requires some skill and knowledge and understanding um, and some upkeep. So we'll talk more about that. And uh, I'm glad that you all know what tools are out there uh, to help you defend. And that's pretty good. Um, so this is great. We'll stop the poll and we can put the answers up if you have yep yeah. you already published the answers right everybody saw the answers oh excuse me there we are cool so, so yeah. there you go five there you are there's the total mm -hmm. and uh yeah it, it, it's interesting response so i think this is the right point for this training where you really are looking to have a monitoring system set up and then um, getting into the next business, which is actually defending, right? So first you have to detect, and then you defend. So we'll talk more about detection today, right? And what it uh, means to be prepared in terms of uh, detection. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So we can close that poll. And uh, so, so let's go into some of the concepts I feel are critical for our discussion today on uh, intrusion detection and really getting <clears throat> ready to face the adversary, right? So we'll recap a little bit uh, for those of you who just came in. I know there are a couple of you who are coming here for the first time for the webinars. Uh, Brittany will be sharing the videos of the other webinars, but we will recap a little bit about knowing the intruders, right? And their behavior. Um, and then we'll talk about how do we get more visibility into attempts that they make uh, through relevant monitoring. And then we'll actually take a, a kind of a scientific approach to detection, um, placing the intrusion detection systems in a place where we can actually get data that we can act upon for defense. So as we all know, <laughs> this has been this very unfortunate event that has happened in the past week um, where our critical infrastructure is being attacked. Right, so we have heard the news of this organization called Darkside that uh, essentially launched a, a ransomware attack on this, uh, you know, colonial pipeline uh, infrastructure that is a critical uh, resource infrastructure for gases, and um, it's 
a surprise, right? We had just you know, figured out all the deal with the solar winds attack that was another major attack that affected government industry <clears throat> and all enterprises. So, you know, we were starting to figure out, you know, what you know was wrong with that and how we could defend. And now this is a real shock. Um, and it's a surprise, right? It's affecting critical infrastructure and all of the latest uh, critical infrastructure has a lot of sensors, lots of devices that are networked. And we talked about this in the past that they all open up new attack surfaces. And so when you have a, a information system and a control system that's completely networked, even if one part of the system is attacked, uh, in this case, the information system was attacked, um, you really, as a precaution, have to take down the control system. So in this case, they had to shut down the entire pipeline operations to figure out the extent of the attack, um, you know, uh, and really have a sense before things are back to operation. So obviously it's very disruptive, right? Uh, systems were taken down, uh, I was surprised, never, People expected a gas line to be hit by a cyber attack of this nature, and it has dire consequences. So today, the gas prices are, you know, at least in Colombia, close to 275. It might go to three dollars when all of us start traveling um, soon for a spring break and summer breaks and all those. So uh, it has consequences, right? These kind of attacks are real, um, and these are what attacks we never anticipate, uh, but as an intrusion basically looks like this. It's a surprise, it's disruptive, and it has dire consequences. So Jason, please go ahead. Oh, and just to add to that, uh, Prasad, is, is traffic is not, airlines are now having to think about routing you know, their, their planes, fuel, you know, they're passing new, uh, passing their opening of emergency services, so that way transportation of fuel can um, ships now. So they're looking at a lot of different ways to overcome emergencies. So most of us. Yeah, yeah. And, and so it's a chain effect. So the consequence is really after the incident, there's a lot that goes on. Like we saw, you know, what else could have gone wrong? Uh, how extent uh, is this attack really affecting the system? So um, it's really disruptive. And so this is really what the intruders are after, right? We see the intruders essentially in an attack target the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of our information system assets. And it could be hardware, it could be software, it could be firmware. Uh, and it's any information data in motion or data in rest. Um, so they try to really affect things we think are critical for our business. And that puts us in a very difficult spot and it's obviously unauthorized, right? This is really somebody doing it uh, maliciously and bypassing whatever security mechanisms we have in place uh, to launch this attack. So what are we worried about when we have an attack? So we're worried about loss of confidentiality. So we might have data that is, you know, personal or, you know, it's private or it has some, you know, identifiable information that's proprietary or you know, sensitive and people really are targeting at, you know, either uh, copying the data, deleting the data, right? Uh, in this case, exposing the data out, uh, which has implications, correct? Um, so uh, loss of confidentiality is a critical, uh, you know, uh, fact that we want to defend against. And today we'll actually talk about uh, in the live demo, a little bit about how these kind of Target attacks really go uh, attack the confidentiality and integrity. You can even modify the data um, or modify the system in a way that causes destruction or there's issues of uh, information non repudiation So you can't tell the source of where information is coming from anymore uh, in a trustworthy manner. And that affects the authenticity of our systems or communications, right? And the worst case, which is you take the whole system down, right? You have essentially caused disruption to the access of the system and the information. Um, and each of these could lead to availability issues. Like we saw the ransomware attack essentially led to a loss of availability. Uh, and they're obviously going to check on or the integrity of the system 
and they are worried about information that is being affected by this ransomware uh, that could be confidential. Um, and so these are the key uh, security concepts that we are worrying about when we have an intrusion. And the intrusions could be low, moderate, and high. Um, you know, there could be intrusions that happen that are you know very localized or minor. Uh, so there's not much of a financial loss or disruption, uh, but it is still of a, a serious consequence, right? It is an incident to begin with. Uh, and the moderate ones, um, there are more of these than the low ones, right? Uh, where people are really trying to take advantage of these systems and they could have serious adverse effects. And this is where the attacker is trying to really hit. Um, if you have come up with a, a decent plan, they have more chance of a moderate attack being successful. Um, so they obviously have significant damage that they want to cause uh, that, and maybe everything might not be down, but you still might have to re deal with it in a very uh, you know, difficult way. And the ones that we really are scared of are the high impact ones where this catastrophic uh, consequences to your uh, operations, assets, uh, even individuals, uh, and the major damage that we want to prevent. So uh, we can think of, like we talked last time, as uh, a risk of this incident, which is you know, the type of attack it is, the likelihood of it happening multiplied by the consequence of it, right? So that really tells you what's the risk of you being exposed to a particular cyber attack. And who are these attackers, right? Where do they come from? And, and, and how do we understand what their motives are, right? Uh, so obviously cyber criminals, uh, we call them hackers or crackers, right? Um, these days they are you know, very organized. They're very professionally skilled adversaries. Um, and there's this uh, Verizon report, uh, which is very popular. They actually found that, you know, 92% of the breaches were by outsiders and 14% by insiders. So this is again, a very serious statistic to say, you know, it's 14% of attacks are within your firewalls and the, the big moats you build to protect everything, right? And the army that's guarding outside doesn't know about this 14% insiders. Um, and so some are involving both, which makes it even harder. So, um, but although the good news is, you know, insiders were responsible for a very small number of very large data set compromises, but, you know, when it happens, it's really bad, right? The insider attacks are, uh, as you know, the government has had, uh, you know, these issues, uh, which Node and others that have really taken a toll. Um, and the attackers, yeah, if you really want to profile them, they are young. As I said, very professional. They are, from, you know, typically Eastern Europe, Russian, Southeast Asian uh, regions. Uh, you know, sometimes you know, motivated by the government to, to do these attacks. They're state-sponsored, um, and they do it like a business. They do it very, very systematically um, with a lot of uh, organization and precision. And so, the adversary is really hard to defeat. Um, and that was one of the dilemmas we were talking last time is, uh, how do we deal with this fact that, you know, they will be sophisticated, but we still have to be prepared, right? Um, so that's the dilemma. And so the simple answer is, if you have a, a defense a budget that's better than the attack budget, right? In some sense, uh, you obviously win. Uh, and it just need not be money, it could be preparation, it could be controls, it could be minimizing the attack surface. So we'll talk more about it. Uh, but there is a way to really know uh, how to defend against the adversary, right? And obviously the adversary, as I said, is organizing in you know, dark markets, underground farms, and they're very coordinated, which is really uh, you know, the difficult part in uh, facing the adversary. And things that they do in terms of intrusion, you know, we know this, this list is a long list. They could impersonate um, an executive to get information, this is the social engineering type of attacks they can do. Uh, they might do remote root compromise um, and uh, there's identity theft. And Daniel here asked a question, the intruders who do these things, uh, is there any particular reasons why they are from a certain ethnicities? Um, we obviously know uh, through FBI and other reports that you know many of these uh, are 
you know, motivated by, for money, right? They're after money, they're trying to make money. Uh, and US is a very good target. Obviously all the countries are being attacked, uh, but we have seen um, a lot of attacks from these particular ethnicities. Um, and it's been a fact proven over and over again. Uh, and uh, we've seen in many cases that they have access to these markets that uh, really are serving these particular ethnicities. And in some cases, they're even state-sponsored, right? The governments are incentivizing these uh, cyber criminals to really launch these attacks, like we saw in the case of our elections to affect you know, uh, national security and so forth. So yeah, so it, it is driven by money. Um, and in these cases, as we talked last time, uh, by the Richard uh, report written by Richard Clark, who led the 9-11 commission, who said the cyber wars are this new national security threat. So uh, it's happening at all levels. Um, and obviously people can make a lot of money and ransomwares are unfortunately a very uh, successful way uh, cyber criminals are making money these days uh, that lead to you know, uh, these ransom payouts, which many people don't know they're doing and that causes an even serious problem. So obviously password cracking, copying databases with credit card numbers. Um, we saw the uh, Park Mobile app being um, hacked recently also. Uh, so it could be any kind of information uh, theft or data theft or uh, when intellectual property theft uh, by some of these state-sponsored attacks that uh, really affect us. So yeah, so we're talking about the intruders some more. Uh, and it used to be people wanted to make a statement by you know defacing a website, uh, you know, and we've seen more serious attacks like the Sony hack we talked about in one of the previous webinars where they do a denial of service attack against Sony in this case because of this movie uh, and it became a national crisis uh, <clears throat> under President Obama. And we prevailed, we, we were able to survive uh, that fact. And, Obviously, there have been others that have really led to more serious issues of national security with uh, the Snowden and others where there's a lot of insider attacks uh, that are hard to defend against. And, you know, there are obviously skilled groups uh, and we know some of these as we hear the news, anonymous, uh, LulzSec. And so there is this activists and even the ones that uh, attacked the pipeline recently say they are an activist, but again, um, you know, they are called the dark side. So they, they operate in a little uh, you know, nefarious way, right? Which is very, very not so uh, uh, easy to know and defend against. Um, and here we're seeing, uh, obviously the types of attacks they are launching are known as advanced persistent threats, right? So these are attacks as we saw from the news this pipeline attack could have been there for several months. Uh, they have no idea uh, to the extent of which this attack uh, was already launched and uh, persistently um, you know, uh, maintained to compromise the systems. So it takes a long time. And in some cases we have seen actually the evidence there were three, four years it took for organizations to know that they were actually attacked. So uh, we talked in the first webinar, the intruders these days are not after you know, showing off that they have attacked you, right? It's really about knowing what your in assets are, uh, compromising them and sustaining their um, you know, position uh, to really find a time and a, a, an asset that you really care about. And then they will come for a ransom or they will launch the attack, which is a surprise, which is going to be disruptive and which has serious consequences for your business. So uh, it's important to know that the attacks are the modern day attacks, especially, uh, are very sophisticated, and you know you really cannot tell if you're really under an attack. And as part of the intrusion, the intruders basically do what I was just saying: uh, is they find a target that they want to really get access to, and it could be done through some social engineering. And we looked at what the attacks really try to do is, is escalate the privilege. They try to find as much control uh, over critical systems they can. Uh, and that could even mean uh, getting access to your monitoring system that's looking for attacks 
and trying to turn them off or try to you know uh, reconfigure the monitoring system that you don't start covering the tracks that they're making, right, to, to launch the attack. So that's also another strategy is uh, as you get more privilege, uh, whatever defenses you have in place, they try to turn those off against whatever they're doing. And then they maintain access for a long time uh, so that they can then understand. And we talked about this uh, case study once with a company where it was a very complicated system and it took this uh, attack group like a couple of months actually to figure out a particular transaction that was running, which was very, very critical to this large business. Um, and once they found that that was a very critical server and a critical transaction that was really high value, um, they launched the attack. And once the uh, security team came in, they were really shocked to find out that somebody could actually have this level of you know, very sophisticated intelligence of a business um, it's a very large business to really launch this sort of a surprise attack. Um, so these are real things that happen uh, and the intruders are very sophisticated in that sense, right? They have more incentive to hide um, and camouflage their activities um, to really find you know, where they can really hurt you. So this is the nature of the intrusion, right? So Jason, you have anything to add here in terms of the intruder behavior? So he's driving, so we'll let him uh, continue that, we'll continue. Uh, so with that, let's go through what we can do, right? Um, so we know what the intruders are up to. Uh, we know how sophisticated they are. We know their motives. Uh, let's try to understand uh, what we could do, right? Um, so uh, what we try to do is really uh, invest in an intrusion detection system or, or some kind of technology where we can find out uh, that there is possibly a security intrusion, right? Um, and how do we do that, right? So we could put these uh, solutions which are called intrusion detection systems or intrusion prevention systems. Um, and they essentially help us in countering these threats and we can know uh, what kind of threat is going on. Uh, whether it's uh, you know, low impact, medium impact, high impact threat. And we could actually tell by some signature, I'll tell you more about it, about what kind of uh, incident it is relating to. And then we can have an adequate response right, to deal with it. Uh, the problem with these systems is you know, they're not really uh, ready for attacks that we don't know about yet. So those are called the zero day exploits where there's an expert where there's no patch for an exploit yet from the vendor of the hardware or the software. Um, and so when the attack happens, we are kind of a, a, a sitting dark or lame, uh, you know, in the sense of we can't act till the vendor comes up with a patch. And the attackers love that, right? They try to exploit the fact that we have no defense against it. And if it is found, they try to maximize the impact and the value they can get from those attacks. So those attacks that we don't have a signature about yet, and there's no defense from a vendor patch or another way to deal with it, uh, those are what we call as the uh, zero day attacks. Uh, so there are newer systems that help us deal with these and I'll talk more about that. Uh, but in uh, general uh, intrusion detection system is something um, that also could work as intrusion prevention system uh, to, uh, find these intrusions right uh, in in real time, and so the difference really of an intrusion detection system and intrusion pr uh, prevention system is not much. Both have pretty complementary things. Uh, they analyze traffic, and they compare the signature of a particular attack to what they're seeing uh, to figure out okay, this is a real intrusion, and it actually means it is this particular intrusion. Um, in the intrusion detection, we're not taking any action. We're pretty much uh, getting information, logging it so that some human or some automated system can look at it and then come up with some kind of a interesting defense uh, solution, right? Or some action to mitigate the impact of the attack. Whereas in the intrusion prevention system, we can actually do something. We can put some policies, we can put some rules, uh, we can have some software to control, uh, some defenses, um, but then we need to keep those rules and those defenses updated uh, to meet the latest kinds of threats. Uh, 
and then you know, different types of attacks have different kinds of features we call them so your intrusion prevention system has to have you know all of the relevant features for every particular attack that you're trying to prevent uh, you know configured so that is a little extra uh, work um, so but we'll talk about these uh, more today uh, and see how we can uh, implement them in our uh, uh, systems so if I have to come up with an intrusion detection system, here are some you know, very important requirements. There are more, but these are at least to begin with. Uh, we need to be having it run continually with minimal human supervision. So it has to be in some sense, um, you know, real time and operational all the time. And it has to be fault tolerant. It has to know how to recur from crashes, reinitialization. So in some sense, we need to make sure that uh, it is working as we expect it to. And obviously it has to resist subversion. So it cannot be attacked. So it is what we trust to tell us that there is an attack. And so we have to make sure that it cannot be attacked. Right? It's like your, um, you know, so many miles gas remaining in your car. If that meter is attacked, it's very difficult to know how to fill up your gas, right? So we trust those meters are working well and we rely on those meters. So we have to make sure that we can make sure that these ideas can resist subversion. And it should be a minimal overhead. It should not really take a lot of resources, generate so much data, you can't analyze it fast enough and put it in too many places where it's hard to really you know, figure out even if there's an attack at what's going on, right? So you should have enough data that you should be able to analyze and have intelligence at the rate and speed you want. And obviously it has to have policies that um, are custom to the assets you're trying to protect and it has to adapt to changes uh, of systems and users and also be you know, uh, up to date to the different attacks that could possibly happen. Right? So knowing that these are the requirements, you know, we could have these intrusion detection systems at a host level, at a network level, or in a distributed level. So we could put these at you know, critical points of web servers or information systems, right? So that we have the monitoring really localized to you know, places we really care about and we're tracking suspicious activity uh, in the host base. In the network base, we're trying to be more broader. So we're trying to catch uh, these attacks through you know, thousands or millions of flows, depending on what kind of enterprise you have, right? So we're trying to look at these network traffic, analyze them, uh, look at the protocols in those flows and identify suspicious activity. So that becomes a little bit more heavyweight, but there are more advantages in a network-based system because you have a much more global picture of what's going on. Uh, and then you can have a combination, which is distributed in a hybrid, which you, know, you put a few host base, you put a few network base, and then you have a central analyzer that's then you know, processing all of this information to give you a better uh, correlation of events uh, if there is an intrusion. And so that's kind of the main, uh, you know, point of intrusion detection system is we want to monitor the hosts as well as the networks. And we put sensors uh, to do these, uh, you know, intrusion detections that, you know, collect data into logs or network packet uh, or system trace files. And then we, create these analyzers that are either sitting locally with the sensor or in a central location to look at what kind of intrusion happens. And then as an administrator, you have some way to look at what's going on uh, and then maybe apply policies uh, to actually then take action if there are certain uh, security issues you want to deal with, right? So this is basically what intrusion detection looks like. And you could put them, as I said, um, in a way which is passive. Uh, so in the network, you know, we see this network intrusion detection system sensor here in the left, where uh, there is a ability to copy all of the traffic that's going on into the, um, you know, the sensor that then uh, is actually working in what we call as a, a promiscuous mode or a, a monitoring interface. And then we do the analysis and then you can do the same thing, right? You can have some host agents and uh, network agents and collect all this data uh, in a passive way to get the information. And as you start looking at the information, obviously the challenge here is that the behavior profiles of what's going on in the network or in the host uh, is gonna match for actual users and the intruders. So it's kind of hard sometimes to say, 
who is the intruder, who is the real user, right? <clears throat> so the crisp distinction is really not easily done. Um, and so you basically get false positives and false negatives. So you might find <clears throat> there's no attack, but then signal there's an attack or there would be an attack and you probably miss it, right? Um, and so uh, it's a difficult proposition to have an intrusion detection system uh, because it's hard to tell the attacker and the intruder uh, all the time. Uh, but still, there is a way in which uh, you could do it. And I'll show you an example uh, of how some of the intruders can really be distinguished right, from actual user behavior. But then if there are insider attacks, like we said before, those are harder because they bypass all the firewalls and security people you're trying to put to look outside, which is where most of the attacks are coming from. And then if there's a combination of inside and outside attack, that is really, really hard to predict and defend against. So what are some of the tools that are you know, implementable as intrusion detection systems, right? So we could use Wireshark is a tool which is open source. NART is another, uh, you know, it, it's both an IPS and an IDS. Um, and it's been maintained uh, and Cisco actually has a lot of hand in it. So. Uh, there's a commercial version of it also, uh, but there are many, many ones like FireEye and others, Bro, um, that uh, depending on the nature of your enterprise and how you want to deal with it, you could be setting it up. Uh, that does essentially what I just said uh, in terms of the requirements for IDS as well as figuring out how to deploy these IDS in your enterprise at a host level or at a network level. So, a little bit more animation on what's uh, IDS doing. So as I said, it's running in a monitoring mode, a passive mode. Uh, we also call it like a promiscuous mode. So all the traffic that's coming into your enterprise, this uh, uh, you know, monitor essentially takes a copy of all of the data uh, and it processes that data. And where does the data go uh, when it's copied? It's basically shown here. So it goes into this start or some kind of intrusion detection system, um, you know, module where the, we decode the packets and then we look at all the headers and the information in that, uh, and then we find a match uh, for a particular signature that we know is malicious, and then we log it. So we can say, oh, this is a flood, this is a, a different kind of a buffer overflow attack, and so we can make these logs. Uh, that are then shown uh, on the user interface, as we saw, uh, for a, a human or some kind of a, a automated script to take action. Okay. So we're going to have this uh, decoding and signature matching uh, happening in the intrusion detection system, so we can know uh, what's going on. So um, SNART, as I said, is, is one I'm um, going a little bit more detailed, but there are, as I said, many others uh, that you can look at. Uh, and we can have a discussion if you already looked at some and what your experience with those are. Uh, but this is a very popular and long standing open source uh, intrusion detection system, which is also intrusion prevention system uh, that logs these alerts by timestamp. Um, and you can really download a lot of you know, rules that then help you, you know, keep up with different kinds of attacks at different layers of the network transport application. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it does essentially what I said, uh, it does decodes the packets, puts through a detection engine, um, logs it and then alerts the <clears throat> people that are responsible for the defense. So with that, let's go into a little bit of a <clears throat> discussion more uh, in the group setting. So. Uh, Jason, I don't know, are you uh, online uh, to give a few comments on what I just said about intrusion detection systems? The only comment I would make, Prasad, is that, uh, you know, when you go to set up your uh, intrusion detection system and you're starting to record that data, you want to go through it and make sure you're getting the data that uh, you're not getting too much data to where it creates an environment uh, where it's easy to ignore the alerts. You want to make sure those alerts that are coming in are valuable information so you can act on them. It's very easy to get overwhelmed by the amount of data that these systems can produce. Also, in inspecting those false positives is some other things that you would want to take into account. Yeah, and it's human nature. We see this system 
you know, give us these alerts. And maybe the first two days we go look at it and we go like, yeah, that's not much important. And then it just becomes noise and we start ignoring it, right? So <laughs> Jason, as he said, if it's not configured or we don't have the right kind of people analyzing it uh, or configuring those systems, uh, you know, we might miss out or we might not really pay attention um, to attacks as they happen, right? Uh, so it, it requires certain skill and some uh, you know, human effort uh, to really maintain, uh, which is probably the reason many people don't really readily have the intrusion detection system or somebody who's really managing and operating it on a routine basis. Uh, but as Jason just said, you know, uh, let's talk about how much data is good, right? And what data is important and, you know, where do we find the trade-offs of too much data versus, you know, missing out on the information, right? So one of the things that would be important in your intrusion detection system design is figuring out where your sensors are, right? And we talked about attacks being a combination of inside attacks and external attacks. We also talked about intrusion detection systems, um, having a combination of sensors at a host level and at a network level, right? Uh, so with this example here, uh, let's try to see where it makes sense to put these sensors, right? And what's the advantage or some of the limitations uh, of having sensors at different locations? So uh, is there anybody who can tell me uh, what is the difference of putting a sensor at location one versus location two? So one is kind of inside, right? The, uh, enterprise, it's sitting just behind the external firewall. Right? And it is pretty much uh, monitoring everything that's going to your DMZ, where you run your web mail servers, as well as your main enterprise switch, which is routing traffic to all your systems, your internal servers and your workstations. Right? So putting it inside is one option, right? And then the other option too is putting it outside. Right, which is outside your external firewall facing the internet um, and then uh, looking for any suspicious activity, right? So anybody can tell me what could be the difference in the two? So you could put it in the chat or you can just speak up. Obviously uh, one, probable observation you can make is if you're putting it at the location two, you are monitoring everything, right? Outside and inside, coming inside. Um, so it's good because you can see things that are potentially gonna attack your network, but there's a lot of information you're gonna see. So that's gonna be the most you know, data heavy configuration, right? If you're putting it outside your external firewall facing the internet, uh, but you're going to have advantages of knowing literally everything that's going in and out. Um, and also potentially that could come in, you can even monitor that uh, at two. Uh, whereas in is a little bit more targeted. Uh, you're looking at everything that's coming in, it's still giving you the global picture, but it's still going to be a lot of information. Uh, and you are going to have the ability to apply policies more globally, uh, correlate events more globally, right? Uh, so it's definitely, uh, uh, sort of a favorite location for most people, right? To put it inside your external firewall. And obviously there are three and four uh, locations which are close to important assets. This is more localized, right? Um, so Stacy says location one can scan the data that has already been filtered by the firewall. Yes, exactly. So there is that extra filtering that has happened. And so you don't see everything, correct? Um, so there is, obviously some filtering that has already happened. And thank you, Stacy. excellent point. And so the data will be lesser, but it really will pertain more to the policies you have in place and more specifically relevant to your enterprise. And in three and four, as you can say, they're getting close to a, what I call as a host-based monitoring, right? So you're getting more closer to where the asset is at the edge uh, of the network. And in the case of three, you can look at all the 
internal server data resource network uh, related specific attacks, you can be more focused. So again, the data is going to be less um, and but your intelligence is going to be much higher, but you might miss out on correlated events that could be a mixture of something at a workstation and an internal server, right? So three and four definitely have better, uh, you know, chance of getting a alert that is more critical for a particular asset you're trying to protect, but then you might miss out some bigger picture. Uh, and so a combination of one, two, three, four would be great, but at least a combination of one, three, or one, four uh, might be more strategic, correct? Very good. So it's a trade-off of how much data you have, how much you can act, how much burden you want to take on looking at these. And the location uh, is going to be very critical uh, as you deploy these uh, intrusion detection systems. Thank you for that. Any other comment on this exercise? So Jason, you have a comment uh, on some of this discussion? All right, let's keep going. So the last part of what I want to say uh, before I you know, have a, a live demo and have a little bit more of a, an exercise for you to take away uh, in terms of your ideas, uh, when you actually have an attack, right? How do you deal with it, right? So we'll talk about that uh, in the practice and reflect. So let's go with, uh, another set of uh, you know, final concepts that are relevant for this discussion. So which is, you know, how do I take this sort of as I said, data driven approach? Uh, do I have the you know, right amount of data? Do I have the right amount of intelligence? Uh, and do I have expertise to handle this, right? Um, <clears throat> how do I go use a data driven approach? And as I said, <clears throat> the attacks have these signatures in many cases, and that's where these rules from SNART and others actually helps so because we know that there is a set pattern um, and the behavior is recognizable, right? Uh, as an intrusion um, or even a misuse of a particular system, you can identify that. Um, so if you have a, a intrusion detection system, uh, most likely it will be a signature based on what, what we call the heuristic system and that will identify known attacks that uh, you know have some pattern which everybody understands. But again, those will be evolving. So you have to always keep up with the rules and download the latest rules um, as you manage your ideas. Um, but the other ones are what we call as anomaly detection based. And these are great for zero day attacks because what they are trying to do in this case is just know there is a change in the normal behavior. So we will track what is normal behavior of you know, our regular users and regular systems performance, right? So we have some, kind of a baseline. And then when we see an anomaly, something that's out of the routine, right? Uh, a change that is interesting, which is sustained, right? It's not just change and it's gone, but it's a sustained change. That's when we call uh, that as an anomaly event. And then you can go forward to investigate that, right? So I know that there's something wrong. Uh, we don't know if it's an attack or not yet. Right? but we can go investigate those anomalies. Um, and that's kind of where we have a better chance of dealing with these zero day attacks because we really don't have a particular pattern, but we've seen that there is an, an effect uh, in the anomaly event that we think is interesting and we can go and do more uh, analysis. So um, it's called threat hunting, you can call it cyber hunting. Uh, so you kind of go hunt for what exactly is happening, right? Uh, for a lot of the sophisticated attacks that we talked about, like the advanced persistent threats, um, anomaly detection is going to be a key way uh, to find uh, the suspiciousness at a host level or at a network level. And that analysis is going to take a, a kind of a different approach than this kind of rule-based approach that's used in signature-based intrusion detection systems. And again, as I said, different attacks, can be detected by these different techniques and there is a suitability uh, which is you know unique to the uh, analysis technique that you put with the data 
So if you're using a signature-based uh, uh, attack detection technique, uh, it's great for an application layer, reconnaissance and attack, same thing, a transport layer or network layer, uh, policy violation. So things that you can really predict are very easily uh, handled uh, by these uh, signature-based detection schemes. Um, and the normal detection schemes really uh, go after things, as I said, which are a change, uh, a radical shift in the baseline of a particular system, right, or a network. Uh, so they're great for like detecting denial of service attacks or these advanced persistent threats where there is a lot of scanning um, of targeted systems uh, or even worms or sort of virus behavior that is spreading uh, and trying to replicate to, you know, really create this infrastructure to launch an attack, right? bots or whatever you want to call them. Um, so so that there are, uh, you know, these virus or worms that tend to uh, replicate and really spread to uh, create a, a massive attack. Now those are easily found by these anomaly detection schemes. And so today uh, I'll show you like a demonstration of how uh, an actual attack happens, right? and how uh, it looks like and what things with this privilege escalation the attacker gets, um, you know, uh, creates you now these consequences, like I said, that are really not so great for our application. Right? So it's a surprise, obviously, it's disruptive, it has consequences. That's kind of what we're looking for in a serious attack, how to deal with that. So I'll show you a, a, a application that uh, we have actually developed in our lab. Um, to really study these attacks. Um, and uh, you know, it's a healthcare application. Um, and uh, I will have you kind of look at it and then we can have a discussion on it. Healthcare data pipeline application host. Hello, everybody. Today we'll be looking at a targeted attack being launched on the healthcare data pipeline. Targeted attacks such as advanced persistent threats can be used to gain unauthorized access to sensitive and confidential data. Let's look at the process. Here, an attacker sitting on a remote computer can perform some malicious activities to gain access to the healthcare data pipeline application hosted in a cloud platform. Using some malicious programmer code, the attacker can steal password of a user that has access to sensitive data or personally identifiable information of various patients. Once the attacker has the password, they can log in to the application or the system and easily access information sensitive to the patients, leading to a loss of confidentiality. Now let's look at the attack being launched. An attacker can remotely try to steal a password for a user that has access to the application using some attack tool. This tool in our demonstration is known as Hydra. Hydra is a powerful password detection or cracking tool that can brute force into an application guessing the right username and password combination. Let's take a look at how this tool can identify a password for a user on our healthcare data pipeline. So this is the healthcare application that an attacker can gain access to by using the Hydra tool. Now, as an attacker, I'll be using the Hydra tool as shown here to try to get a password match onto the application. So as shown in the browser earlier, this IP here belongs to the healthcare data pipeline application. For a compromised username, I can use the tool to get the correct password by launching this command into my computer. So as you can see, it has already figured out the password for the user hitting this uh, healthcare pipeline application. And now let's see how this password can be utilized to access the system. I'm going to copy this and then paste it here. 
So there you go. The application is already compromised. The attacker can access the system and perform any malicious activities here on. So this application allows users to request some information on the patient, given some search criteria, and access their sensitive information. And the attacker can now exploit this access. Let's launch this data request form to access some sensitive information on patients. So here is the form. I will be entering some details here to perform the search. For a certain criteria and to uh, show the demonstration, let's just limit this to just 15 records and let's run this form. On the step three, what we will see is some data information related to the patients. So here you can see there are 15 records generated out of this tool, which is basically very sensitive information on some of the patients. For example, the year, year of birth, gender name, race name, ethnicity, the ID, and even broader amount of information can be accessed by the attacker, given that they have already gained access to the system, and which is definitely a loss of confidentiality. This is the end of the demonstration. Thank you. So as we saw, you know, uh, this could be any application, uh, and this was just an idea of how an attack looks like, right? When somebody is doing things, um, you know, and most of the times we cannot tell that this attack is going on, that people are you know, accessing our data or, uh, you know, taking control of important resources. Uh, so what we're showing here is a, a, a data pipeline, right, in the demonstration uh, that's sitting in a cloud. It could be on your, you know, on-premise data center as well. And you're getting in data. In this case, it's a healthcare application. There's a lot of health data being brought from different data sources, from the clinics, from other databases. Um, and you have an entitlement DB, which is telling who can look at the data, who can make copies of the data, who can change the data. And then the data as it's being processed is being sent to different uh, you know, people, right? So, so to an administrator, to a clinician, to a researcher. And so the attacker is really trying to find any way that they can escalate their privilege so then they can affect the system, right? Um, the more they can get to the point, they're able to get entitlements to change the data or copy the data, uh, it, it has huge consequences. So in some cases, if it's a, say a Cerner health database, you know, it costs like hundreds of thousands of dollars. So if they make one copy, they could be selling it, right? Uh, to many people. So there's a lot of intrinsic value uh, in making such compromises. And obviously it could go to individuals, right? It could hurt individuals if it's uh, personally identifiable information. Um, and you can think of this as even a, a financial system that we saw in the recent news. Uh, you could be using it to manipulate financial uh, trades that could again hurt our economy. So. Um, it could be a simple, you know, business application that's critical for whatever you need to do to create revenue, right? So this is a very classic application use case and a lot of our applications are data driven. So the data uh, is really the king these days or queen. And so the attackers are after uh, more of these data compromises. So with that, I think we, uh, can go into a sort of a practice reflex session. Uh, I just ping again, Jason, are you there? Uh, are you able to pitch in with any more comments? Okay, so yeah, he's been driving today, so we'll <laughs> you know, see if he can come back later. But uh, so here's what I wanna do as a, a group exercise, right? Um, so I want you to put uh, yourself in the shoes of 
you know, an actual incident that has happened in your enterprise, right, or in your business, um, and what are the things you could probably do? So let's just get into that mindset of being affected by an intrusion. So how do we act? Uh, and obviously, we talked about an intrusion detection system, which is great, uh, which requires very minimal human intervention. Um, and we saw how it could be sophisticated uh, with rules, um, or you could have anomaly detection-based techniques uh, that really can look at, you know, um, you know, what kind of attacks are possibly happening. And we looked at some strategies of where to put the sensors, how to correlate the information to really have a better understanding. So there's a lot of things we talked about, but the basics is when there is an attack, it's a surprise. We don't know the extent of it. It's, it's going to be disruptive. It has affected something we know is very critical. And then we really don't know the total consequence of what has happened, right? So that's kind of where this uh, whole gas line was shut down because they're figuring out what is the extent to which this attack could have uh, compromised systems. So because if they have sensors and critical infrastructure that has been hacked, they don't want to bring it to the operational state without confirming that none of those things are really going to be a problem uh, due to the attack. So let's make a simple exercise here uh, as a demonstration. So if you just think about your PC and let's say it's responding very slow uh, for information requests from the net. And then you kind of look at a little bit on the intrusion detection system or Wireshark or whatever tool you have, and you can see your network gateway shows this very high level of network activity even though you've closed all your applications, right? Your email, your web browser and programs that access the net, right? So the question here is, you know, what types of malware uh, could cause these uh, symptoms, right? Uh, of uh, unusual behavior, right? And how might have the malware have gained access to your system? Let's think about that. Um, and then what steps do you take? to check whether this is actually a malware, right? This is something that you need to be worried about. And if you do identify that it's a malware, you know, how do you go about restoring it to a safe operation? Um, so this is a simple exercise. Um, I will provide you a, a sort of a document that you can uh, actually use um, for this. Give me a second. So I put this uh, link to this document in the chat. So you can open that link. It's not a virus, <laughs> it's just a document. <laughs> so you can open it up and it looks like this. And you don't have to send this to me or anything, but <clears throat> it's good to kind of think about this in a simple use case. And you could you know, extend this exercise to um, you know other cases you feel like are probable threats that could affect your assets, right? So you could do this exercise um, and what if scenarios and kind of come up with a, a game plan of uh, acting if there's actually an incident. Right? So think about it for a couple of minutes. So <clears throat> let's do a, a simple uh, answer session here. If you have other answers, please feel free to you know, speak up or <clears throat> put messages in the chat. Uh, if you're having lunch and you could not do that, that's fine, I totally understand. <laughs> um, so obviously we're looking at a very um, sophisticated program that's obviously you know, going around our defenses, right? Then, 
it is doing some activity that is suspicious. So it could be, you know, in this case, a, a malware, we call it, or a virus or a worm that has some behavior of uh, a coordinated, uh, you know, attack. So we call it a, a attack where it has a command control that's launching this attack from <clears throat> outside and they're trying to really manipulate your system, right, or your network. So how must how could I have that malware have gained access? Obviously, we saw here with uh, the demo that uh, Roshan showed, uh, you know, password social engineering is very common where, uh, you know, people are coerced to actually respond or in some cases, people click on links that again could lead to, uh, you know, these malware launching that is trying to find sensitive information in your system. Um, and so any of these could be uh, possible or attachments that are from your emails. So, uh, you know, this is a major problem, right? You could have all these defenses, but if your uh, users are not doing the basic things of not clicking uh, suspicious attachments or clicking links that could trigger these malwares within your enterprise uh, or just being vulnerable to social engineering attacks. Right? So that's why Jason uh, in the previous, uh, cases, you know, stressed training is going to be very, very critical because humans are sort of our major asset, also our major vulnerability in an enterprise. So uh, obviously we here in this case, the, the malware has uh, gone through some of these different ways in which we've been vulnerable. And so what can you do, right? Obviously, as I said, you could check your logs. If you have these uh, uh, intrusion detection systems, uh, installed, you can look at those uh, interfaces, use interfaces to uh, kind of start correlating what's going on, right? Uh, looking at signatures uh, that's being, uh, uh, you know, detected. Also, the sources and destinations of the services that are generating this traffic. Um, that's another way to be seeing it. Um, and Jason is saying uh, it could be embedded in free software or pirating software, absolutely. So that's another way. Uh, these uh, uh, malware can get into your systems. It's very easy, even in big major places, right? We saw even elections being affected uh, by people clicking email messages uh, in sort of Hillary Clinton's campaign, we saw the same problem. So it, it happens and it's real. Uh, and so this is the hard part, how do we act, right? So you probably can look around, get some more information, uh, how do we act? And in many cases, as I talked in the past, with the Sony hack or even in this gas pipeline attack, uh, people might be considering to completely replace all the hardware software. And maybe that's not possible in, in, in a small business because that's too much cost. Um, but that's a very uh, you know, aggressive way to deal with the attack. Just say that I, I'm gonna throw out everything and then completely bring in absolutely new equipment, which I think is highly trusted. And then that way I clear any trace of any uh, attack remnants that could still be there and that could you know, uh, reoccur, right? Or relaunched, uh, uh, can be relaunched by this command controlled by the attacker. So that's probably too much of a way to do it. But then uh, we talked about some of the security design principles where we said, if we were to begin with isolations where important critical assets are on separate networks, they can be isolated easier. Uh, in that sense, you can know that there could not have been a, a over, uh, you know, effect, right? Uh, where one isolated system affects the other isolated system. So having better isolation could be one way. So you could use that best principle to take the targeted system that you think is the source of the destination of the attack and then take it offline, right? Uh, and obviously this a, a way to create a backup, uh, you can do that, but again, they might have the infected files in them. Um, but in some cases, you can probably rebuild it from a most recent backup, right? It's probably free from the malware and at least that particular system you can reset. So you can, again, in this case, have a, a more localized way of dealing with it and also isolating the attack. And obviously if there's no backups and you're not able to have this isolation, um, you know, you can try to use some tools that are there out there or antivirus packages. And obviously the most disruptive thing is completely change everything, right? So this is a very simple exercise. 
but the consequence as you can see here is dire right it is uh, you know many cases hard to handle and it's happening uh, and it's happening in real time we don't know how to react um, and I have a joke, you know, this is uh, not meant to be a real attack scenario, but I was once in a meeting in my office and suddenly I saw all these like cryptic characters uh, coming on my screen. And uh, obviously, you know, things you would do is like, yeah, shut down the network interface. And, you know, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, it turns out, you know, my son was in the neighboring uh, room uh, at my desk and I had my wireless Bluetooth keyboard <laughs> attached to a laptop and he was just banging away on the keyboard. But the fact was, you know, in that meeting, I was doing something important and this happening on my screen, which is very, very unusual, right? Uh, it's hard to know how to react to it. So when you're in an actual incident scenario, uh, it is a very, very difficult situation. So knowing really what to do uh, and having some kind of a plan sometimes really helps, right? So you uh, at least can try to uh, deal with the uh, incident when you really don't have time to think, right? So these action plans are kind of important. So even though you have intrusion detection system, <clears throat> you have to have some ways in which you know how to recover, uh, to come back to a safe state. So any questions on uh, this exercise? It's a very simple exercise, but I just wanted to be in that situation of you are going through an incident, how do you react? How do you think about it? You know, and it's good to have a plan. And this webinar series really has been emphasizing that it's about preparations, being ready uh, in case it does happen. And, and we always talked in the past, it's like a termite salesman uh, in the context of cybersecurity, you are a small business that has been attacked or will be attacked uh, or you know will soon be attacked, right? So. Uh, you have to be ready. And so to close strong, uh, Jason, do you have any comments? Last time, what yeah. you, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you know, I would just like to stress again that uh, have a plan, test the plan, document, uh, you know, those tests, make adjustments and uh, continue to, to evolve your, your solution. The thing I would suggest that uh, people do is consider bringing in your leadership team, the owner, the, the CEO, whoever that is, into these conversations early in this testing process and documentation process so you can get their buy-in. You also get them involved in coming up with a solution rather than making that dreaded call that their business is under attack and uh, you know surprising them. So. That would be some of the things I would add. Yeah, that's a great point. And obviously your management is important. Um, your peers are going to be important too. So in this world, no one person knows the answer. So the solution to most of these you know, critical incidents is going to be a collective response. Uh, and, and that's it. another field uh, in cybersecurity, which is called threat intelligence sharing. Um, so knowing, uh, information at the right time, at the right place from the right people could be really valuable. Uh, and here we're seeing in this cartoon, um, when you really have an incident, uh, you are asking these questions. Do I have additional data to really confirm what's going on? Who is an expert who can tell me you know, how to interpret what I'm seeing and really validate um, some of the hypothesis I have created around what's actually going on, right? And in most times you might find somebody else like this person B who has already solved the problem. So maybe you, you can find guidance from somebody who's already familiar with what you're experiencing, right? So you can have some kind of a, uh, a feedback loop uh, where you, know, you can just uh, you know, outsource this expertise, right? Uh, and so uh, this threat intelligence sharing is a, another important aspect where you really you know, look for more cooperation you look for data from multiple sources, multiple experts, um, and you can actually tell uh, these events that are actually critical and that are soft, right? Critical events are basically they take things down and the soft events are, you know, you've not been really affected uh, in a real way, but there is an incident that's happening, which, you know, could become a, a critical event or which still has to be stopped. Right, so there's two ways you can think of the critical silent events, which really take down your systems, 
the other events where there's something unusual going on, your systems are still operational, but you still need to deal with those, right? So the threat intelligence is a very important part. And one takeaway from this is, you know, you shouldn't go at it alone, right? Uh, you should be part of a community. You should be publishing and subscribing um, to, you know, like if you join the uh, SNART community, or there are several resources online where you can keep on top of uh, these threats and how to deal with these threats um, and become part of a, a, a ongoing community that is, uh, you know, uh, finding ways to apply the best practices or in case there is an attack, finding ways to deal with it in the most effective way in a timely manner, right? So building a community uh, or being part of a community uh, is going to help you storm around these threat crises. So uh, this is something else to remember and have some investment where you are, uh, you know, in the know, right, uh, of what's going on and you're able to outsource some of these issues. In fact, they do come up, right? You could have some third party, you could have some insurance, you could have somebody who is, um, you know, maintaining these intrusion detection system <clears throat> and uh, having some kind of a regular way to look at these soft critical events, especially that may not look like they take your systems down, but they are interesting, important to keep a lookout for. So Jason, you want to add something about being part of the community? You know, I, I, that's a critical piece because sharing information across the industries, I mean, just because you're in a manufacturing space or the financial space, um, it doesn't matter. And you're going to say, face the same threats, especially when you have insider threats or third party vendor threats, uh, um, maybe utilizing the same uh, intrusion detection system, and you can gain tips on how they've set it up or how they're parsing through their data. So being a part of that community is, is huge, especially across industries. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. So anything from the participants, you know, Daniel or anybody else, Stacy, uh, you know, if you have any questions or any discussion points. I hope this uh, was a valuable uh, webinar. Um, and next webinar, we'll actually talk about more on the defense aspect. So, you know, the detection is going to be very important as we saw here and dealing with the data driven way is going to be critical. Um, and having a strategy of you know, what probably could be done to act is one. Uh, in the next one, we'll actually show how we can be on top of the attacker. So how we can have a defense that is very intelligent. Um, and we call that as active defense. So a lot of these defense we talked here is, uh, you know, some of the technologies in the old uh, industry practice is more passive technologies. So the latest products, if you see, uh, they help you to more active defense. So you can actually trick the attacker, uh, you know, uh, in uh, revealing your assets. Um, that makes it harder for them to know what's really valuable. Um, so you, you can also have some kind of a little bit of an offense on the attacker also sometimes. Um, so we can talk about those things in the next webinar and actually show you a demonstration of some of these active defense techniques. So a technique we have developed is called defense by pretense. Um, so the deception uh, is going to really help deflect some of the attacker's budget in places that they have no reward and that disincentivizes them, right? Um, so we'll talk a little bit more on those interesting concepts of defense. Um, and uh, especially like we talked about policies, how to update those policies. Uh, so we'll give you some examples of those uh, from a defense perspective in the next webinar. So any other questions for today? Yeah, if, uh, if not, uh, thank you so much for this amazing information. It really, it really is uh, something to think about. Yeah, we have a lot of thank yous in the chat. Um, so join us again next week, 1130 Central Time uh, for our next uh, session in this webinar series. Um, you'll be getting a survey right after this. Um, we'd love your feedback on how you enjoyed it. And then also I'll send links to the previous 
uh, videos, previous webinars, if you weren't able to watch those. All right. Yeah, thank you, Brittany. Thank you all for coming, and I'm looking forward to the next webinars. I'll see you soon.